And that's why the vaxxers, the anti-vaxxers include security. Good morning. This is uh, myths in popular uh, psychology with, <laughs> you know, I actually have read this four times now, uh, with uh, Dr. Ginger Campbell and Dr. Scott Leuenfeld. Uh, Dr. Campbell is with sciencepodcasters.org, the, I can't remember the tagline, the, say it, the, place to, the place to find great science podcasts, right? It, well, that was easy. <laughs> and I just met Dr. Leuenfeld. He's with Emory. That's all I know about him. <laughs> and I'm going to turn it over to you guys. You have the floor. Everyone. Thank you. Well, welcome to Dragon Con, and thanks for choosing to come to this instead of somebody famous. <laughs> um, Scott, my, de my guest today, uh, is the co-author of a great book I recommend to all of you called 50 Great Myths of Popular Psychology. And what we're going to talk about today really is a follow-up on what we talked about in the early session, in the opening round. I want to um, follow up on what Derek and Jamie said about the fact that a lot of the uh, critical thinking errors that we make and our tendency to believe stuff that's not true has to do with how our brains work. Uh, Dr. Lillenfeld is a professor of psychology and he has a passion for uh, studying this area, I think, don't you? I sure do. <laughs> Have you ever been to DragonCon before? This is my first DragonCon. Can you believe it? Yeah. And uh, it is going to be, it's going to have to be the first of many. I have to say, I just love these get-ups costumes. I think it's, you guys are so much more cool than my academic colleagues. You know, we're, we, are, we are so stuffy, and it's so rare that I'm the most normally dressed guy in the room. It feels really, it feels great. But it's, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Can you start out by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. I um, actually, uh, let's see, where can I start? I was originally an astronomy major, uh, undergraduate, I went to Cornell, and I had this unbelievably naive idea that I was going to study with this guy named Sagan, I think his name was. Um, I swear to God, I, I literally thought I was going to do it. It's like so embarrassing. Uh, I think in the four, uh, four years I was there, he was filming the show Cosmos on PBS, and I think I saw him a grand total of once on campus. I was like walking by him, and I muster up my courage, and I said, hello, Dr. Sagan. And he went, hello. <laughs> it was actually very nice. Um, it wasn't that, but uh, many years later, I actually did get to meet him and, and had a great uh, time with him, a real gentleman and a, a tremendous person. Um, but I did end up switching for various reasons to um, psychology undergraduate. It's always been my, my love and my passion. And um, I did my graduate work at University of Minnesota in the clinical psychology program. So I'm a clinical psychologist by training, so I, I study uh, mental illness and its treatment. I, I don't do psychotherapy anymore. I once did. Once upon a time, I miss doing it. May go back to doing it a little bit. And uh, I had my first job at a place called SUNY Albany, upstate New York, actually not too far from Ithaca in Cornell. And I've been at uh, Emory since 1994. And um, I have gotten really interested in uh, scientific thinking and how it applies to clinical practice. Much to my dismay, and I have to say, I was very naive again uh, going into the field. I really assumed that the field of psychology, especially my own field, was one in which scientific thinking was widely accepted and was very prevalent. But I was wrong. Um, <laughs> I was wrong. And um, again, I think uh, there's actually a lot more openness to it than many of us may think. But I also think that we don't do a very good job as a field. The mea culpa, I think, when I first started teaching it as well, I think I just assume that scientific thinking comes naturally to people, and I realize the hard way that it, it does not. It doesn't come naturally to me either. Um, and um, I think we need to do a better job of, of imparting it. Yeah, that's why I wanted to have you here today, because um, we talk a lot in the skeptical community about trying to um, get rid of what, what we call woo and a lot of paranormal thinking and all. And it, I think it's important to realize that the problem of poor critical thinking skills even goes into professional areas 
where you would assume the people had those skills. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about a little bit today. Uh, I think you already answered my first question, which was going to be how did you get into um, investigating these myths and pseudosciences because of what you experienced in your own yeah, I mean, I, I, it was really by accident. I've always, always been sort of a lover of skepticism and scientific thinking. Uh, but I, I really did not intend to get into it until maybe early 90s. I found this magazine called Skeptical Inquirer, uh, maybe around 1991, 92. And also I, I started seeing some things in the field, my own field of clinical psychology in terms of psychotherapy diagnosis, that I had not expected to find. I was actually pretty shocked to find how prevalent some bad practices were. And just by hook or crook and partly by accident, I just started doing some writing about this and um, started getting both some, some hate mail and some fan mail as a result. And I think that actually made me, me realize there is a, a real need for it because it's not something many people in our field do. Absolutely. And that's also, I guess, what motivated you to end up writing this book with your co-authors. So to start out with, could you define for us what you mean by the term pop psychology? Yeah, that's a good question, Ginger. I, I think uh, what we mean by pop psychology is really kind of this amorphous industry. It's not one big monolithic thing, but this kind of amorphous industry that is this big other world out there that is outside of uh, academia uh, and scientific psychology. It consists of self-help books, about 3,500, by the way, published per year, of which about 95% remain uninvestigated. Uh, magazines, TV, cable news, internet, everything that propagates largely kind of common sense inductions about human nature that aren't necessarily grounded in science. Just to be clear, I think there is some good pop psychology out there. I think there are some good self-help books out there. So. We try in this book, whether it's successful or not, is something I think readers will judge us on, but we try to point out that not all pop psychology is bad, but there's a real disconnect between a lot of pop psychology and a lot of scientific psychology. And I don't think our profession, those of us in academia, have done a very good job of educating the public about what aspects of pop psychology are well supported uh, and which are not. And how does pop psychology relate to what some people call folk psychology? Yeah, I think pop psychology often, so folk psychology I sort of think of as, as what's often loosely termed common sense. There are probably four or five different definitions of what common sense is, but what we often mean by common sense, what we talk about in our book, are what one of my PhD mentors, Paul Meal, called fireside inductions, kind of things that kind of seem natural, they kind of seem right, they're passed on from one person to another, they are kind of folk wisdom. So I think a lot of the pop psychology industry feeds on folk wisdom. It often seems to make sense. It accords with our intuitions. It accords with our gut hunches. So as a result, I think it inadvertently capitalizes and seizes on uh, our folk wisdom. So take one example, um, the belief that expressing anger when you're ticked off about something is always good for you. I think that makes a certain amount of folk common sense because, in fact, we do observe most of the time that when we get angry and we express it, we feel better afterwards. Uh, the problem with that, the research seems to show, is we are mistaking a uh, basically a correlational finding uh, for a causal finding. What probably is actually happening there is that anger, as we all know, tends to be a very short-lived emotion. If we do absolutely nothing, the odds are high the anger will subside on its own. But what ends up happening is we get angry, we yell, we scream, we hit the wall, whatever. We feel better later. We then may make the mistake of attributing that decline in anger to uh, our action. There's a good example of folk wisdom making a certain amount of sense, but it's probably not that well scientifically supported. Yeah, that's kind of like in my area, people are always so convinced that those antibiotics they got for their cold made them oh, better yeah. when it was right. <laughs> really but, just yeah. that they were going to get better anyway. Right, exactly. Yeah. It, um, early on in your book, you say we can't trust our common sense, and that's kind of an important principle here. You want to talk a little bit about why that's true? Sure. I think, and this is probably kind of old hat to most people in the audience. I think skeptics are really familiar with this concept, but I think it's, to me, it's really important educationally, which is uh, I tend to agree with, with some science writers like Lewis Wolpert and Alan Cromer and my colleague Bob McCauley in philosophy and Emory that a lot of science is really uncommon sense. If you look at the history of science and many of the most misguided notions in science, I think a lot of them were very subjectively compelling because they really fit our common sense notions. I mean, the most obvious ones, of course, are 
flat earth and the geocentric universe. I think even we forget that concepts like intelligent design theory, I think a lot of us skeptics are bewildered as to why intelligent design theory is so popular. Some of it undoubtedly is its religious connection, of course. There's no doubt about it. But I think some of it also we forget is that it kind of seems right to a lot of people. It kind of makes sense. I mean, it is intuitively, I mean, sometimes for me, I'm a big lover of nature. It's a big lover of wildlife. For me, I have to sometimes step back and say, my God, this was actually produced by natural selection, and it was, but it seems very implausible because the human mind did not evolve to grasp such huge expanses of time, did not evolve to grasp uh, these kinds of naturalistic processes. So again, intelligent design theory, I, I think, and a lot of notions that, that we debunk, I think are really resistant to change. I think there are a lot, of, a lot more obstacles to debunking those ideas because they do seem to be intuitive to so many people. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to talk about some specific examples, but I thought you might want to go over some of the basic critical thinking skills, which are going to be familiar to many people in the audience, but, but they're important when evaluating um, claims in psychology. Yeah, sure. So in the book, we, um, we sort of talk about a, a toolkit of critical thinking skills. Again, a lot of these are going to be familiar with the skeptics, but I mentioned one already, confusing uh, correlation with causation. That may be the biggie. I think Stephen Jay Gould argued that may be the single most common mistake. And again, I'll tell you, I, I teach introductory psychology. I was actually teaching my class just yesterday, and it is so easy to get students to repeat this mantra, correlation isn't causation. You know, they, they remember it, uh, but when it comes to actually applying it to a real-world example, that seems plausible. They forget all about it. Uh, it's really, really hard to get that notion uh, across. So when you give them a really silly example, like the fact that there is a substantial, which is actually true, by the way, um, this is undoubtedly found by a researcher with too much time on his hands, who found that there's a substantial negative correlation between the number of PhDs given out in a US state and the number of mules uh, in that state. Uh, <laughs> actually true. Uh, they, you know, it's funny. My students can usually figure that one out. It takes a few seconds, but pretty quickly they realize, no, nah, it's probably not that the mules are driving the PhDs out of the state. or you know, like, It's probably because there's some third variable, like you know, ru rural versus ethnic status. Wyoming doesn't have many universities, but has a lot of mules. And uh, uh, <laughs> my home state of New York has a lot of universities, but I didn't see a single mule growing up there. Uh, so they usually get that. But because of uh, what's sometimes called belief bias, when there is a correlation that is intuitively plausible, so for example, that teenagers who listen to more rock and roll have more sex or something like that, you know, they go, oh, that, that must be some direct correlation. And it, well, it is a correlation, actually. So therefore, because it's correlated, it must be causal. Therefore, listening to rock and roll must make you have more sex, because there you can actually draw a causal link more clearly. So that's, that's one we talk about. We also talk about a related one. You mentioned it earlier with regard to the cold antibiotics example. The anger example is post hoc ergo propter hoc. Uh, after this, therefore, because of this, again, if A precedes B, it is so tempting to think that A, therefore, must cause B. Again, I think if there's a key theme, I think we tend to forget in the skeptical movement. And I think if there is a, a flaw in the skeptical movement, I think it's that we often forget that these are quite natural tendencies. These are ones that have to be not really just learned, but unlearned. We have to unlearn these tendencies because that's the way our brains tend to think. Our brains do tend, I think, quite naturally to see causal connections. That's probably, by the way, a basically adaptive tendency. That's good most of the time, but sometimes it will lead us astray. So those, that's two examples of a bunch of others we talk about. Okay. And those are, like you said, probably the two most important ones. I think that there was um, another one that really struck home to me was the uh, um, exposure to uh, a biased uh, sample. Uh, anyone who works in a specific field, like a psychologist or a physician, you know, if you see a lot of sick people, for example, you get a feeling that there's more sick people and that you that they're a do the dominant species, um, <laughs> and, and and we this is one that that um, that scientists and clinicians you know can oh, yeah. easily fall prey to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll give a real quick example of that. And this is a touchy one, just to be honest. It's politically correct. It's, um, I have to be very sensitive about this when I um, talk to this about my intro students. But there's a very widespread belief that child sexual abuse is very, very closely linked to later psychopathology. Now, I personally actually would be shocked if there were not some direct causal link between child sexual abuse and psychopathology. I think the literature actually kind of 
points in that direction. There's probably some link. But it's also probably been massively overestimated, which I actually don't think is necessarily a good thing. Because as, as a field, we often send the message that if you've been abused, you are doomed to developing problems later uh, in life. A lot of websites even talk about being scarred for life. Now, why is that? When I've talked about this in clinical audiences, I often get the following criticism. Clinicians will say, no, you're wrong. Uh, you're stuck in the ivory tower. You're not seeing the cases I'm seeing, which is actually a valid point. So what's their point? What they say is, well, all the people I see who have been abused are having problems. <laughs> True. <laughs> the problem is um, they're doing psychotherapy. Uh, so th they're not seeing the other cells of that fourfold table. And, and one big flaw, I think, in the training of a lot of, I don't want to speak for physicians, but I can speak for clinical psychologists. I think one big flaw in our training that has been talked about, in fact, it was even talked about by some of David Shackoff, who was the founder of our field in 1949. He actually said this, but it's been ignored. It's really important that clinical psychologists get exposure to lots of normal people, too. Um, <laughs> it's really important, because if they do that, they will see that there are plenty of sexually abused people who undoubtedly have been through hell. Um, and undoubtedly have been through things that most of us cannot understand, but they have survived and some of them have thrived in spite of what happened to them. And I think that's a really positive, affirmative message I think our field can send that we often don't send. All right. And of course it's always easier to see the errors in reasoning on somebody else's thinking no, than your own. Absolutely. <laughs> We're all prone to that, myself included. <laughs> yeah. I bet anyone who reads this book, you're going to find at least one thing in here that you thought was true that's not. <laughs> I found a couple, maybe more. Um, okay, so one area that I think is a good jumping off point is myths about memory. Uh, and I was talking to this gentleman down here about this earlier. Our, I'm going to just ask you this as a question. Are our memories as reliable as we think they are? Well, mine is, but <laughs> um, um, well, you know, it, it's a tough call. I think um, the, the answer is probably not. Uh, our memories work pretty well, uh, and um, a lot of the time, I mean, and sometimes our memories are, are remarkable. So there's one classic study, for example, done in the 70s where they showed people, I think 20, if I recall correctly, I think it was 2,500. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, paired photographs of one object they had seen, one object they hadn't seen, uh, or, two, or two objects, okay. Um, you know, like a scissors and a whatever, a fork, a dog or a cat, a specific thing. 2,500 flashed about a couple seconds each. Then a couple days later they brought them back and they had to identify which of those do you remember seeing? And the accuracy rate overall was 93%. Um, so a lot of the times their memory works pretty well um, and, and natural selection has endowed us on, with a remarkable system. But by the same token, our memories are clearly fallible. And I think what people forget is that we are often very prone to what are called, to be a little technical here, source monitoring errors, where it's not so much that our memories per se are wrong, but that we often confuse what we're remembering. So we actually are remembering something, uh, but we're confusing it. So, the whole term, and I use this term to sort of false memories and so on, I think that term may be a little bit misleading um, in that we are actually, when we have a false memory of something, and I've had plenty of them, um, <laughs> uh, what happens or when someone has a false memory of being abused or being abducted uh, by an, an alien or something like that. Um, the, in, in a sense it's a false memory, but in a sense it's probably more accurate to say it's a true memory but of something that didn't happen. They're remembering either a fantasy or remembering something they imagined and then confusing that with an actual objective memory. So I think sometimes it's, it's easy to think of our memory system as just making up stuff out of whole cloth. Sometimes we do, admittedly, but more often than not what's happening I think is we are getting confused about the origins or source of that memory. And then our memories are dyna uh, dynamic, so every time we think about something we actually have to generate that memory anew and so anything that's happened in the meantime can influence what we remember. Um, I think you, you mentioned one of the examples from the, the Challenger uh, disaster which is a really famous one that uh, a couple years ago I was in interviewing Dr. Robert Burton and he also quoted that one because they actually interviewed people right after the Challenger disaster, had them write down what they were doing, what they were feeling, brought them back two years later, asked them 
what they were doing, what they were feeling, and the correlation, I think it was like 25% of them matched, and the rest of them had entirely different memories. And there were even people who they showed them their own handwriting. You said, you, this is what you wrote. And there was one guy who said, yeah, I wrote that, but that's not what happened. What I remember now is what happened. Yeah. No, a lot, in fact, that study was actually done um, a couple miles from here, where I teach at Emory University. Uh, these were Emory University students, and um, yeah, about, um, about two-thirds showed uh, some marked discrepancies, and about a third were, were wildly different. And it is interesting, you're exactly right, that a lot of people actually preferred their first, uh, their, uh, their later memories to their first memories, even though, given what we know about memory, almost certainly the first memory had to be more accurate. But I think what ends up happening is we end up kind of constructing a narrative, we get comfortable with that narrative, and we just kind of live with it. So, and that's one reason why we're often so sure of our false memories. Yeah, I kind of like that story better, you know. <laughs> Remember that time at the wedding when, you know, these two guys got into a big argument and they made up later? No, they didn't made up. They're not talking to each other. No, I kind of like that. I like the, uh, the ending I thought of later better. I mean, and we, we often, our memories are very much like possessions. You know, they, they are part of us. And I think oftentimes many of us get offended when someone questions our memory because they're part of our, it's part of our identity. It's something that we, uh, it belongs to us in a very powerful way. What about the idea that people commonly repress traumatic memories? Yeah, that's a really contentious one in the clinical community. So um, that's one I think you're going to get a lot of disagreement on. I have to say, I'm, I'm probably a bit more open to the possibility that there are repressed, truly repressed memories than some skeptics are, but I'm also not terribly persuaded by the evidence. I'm open to it, but I keep waiting for a really clear-cut case, and I haven't really seen it yet. Um, I mean, there's no doubt that people some of this is definitional. Usually what we mean by repression is it is a kind of motivated forgetting. And once you f forget it, it is not accessible unless you, of course, undergo some kind of psychotherapy or hypnosis. Ostensibly, that's the way the story goes. I don't believe that, but that's, that's the claim. Um, there's no question that people will often forget unpleasant experiences. They often will not attend to them. They want to not think about them and so on. The question is, can people literally uh, repress uh, painful memories? Uh, especially traumatic memories. And then, of course, the, the converse part, which is even more controversial, is can they then bring them out in, in accurate, pristine form years or decades later? And um, uh, I think the evidence there is, is still uh, inconclusive. I think the one thing that should not be controversial, though, in my view, is that a large proportion, nobody knows how many, but a large proportion of so-called recovered memories, especially those in psychotherapy, uh, are, are confabulations, are not accurate. Whether any of them are accurate, I think, is still uh, up for grabs. So this brings up the issue of how do you evaluate a claim like this? I mean. You, we often talk about the importance of double-blind studies, but I'm not sure I can figure out how we would do a double-blind study of this. Yeah, well, one big problem is in some domains of psychology you can do double-blind studies and some you can't. So in psychotherapy being one obvious example, it's an area I do some writing in, you can't do a double-blind study of psychotherapy. There's no way to, to keep someone blind to the fact they're receiving a psychotherapy. You just can't do that. <laughs> you can't. You can approximate, but you can't do it. Same thing is, is true here. The best you can do, and people have done this, is to try to find cases where there is very, very specific evidence that the person claims to remember that then matches other kinds of evidence that they not presumably did not otherwise have access to. Too. Now, there were some interesting cases that um, were unearthed by someone named Jonathan Schooler, who was actually a student of uh, someone named Elizabeth Loftus, who was a big memory researcher, who was a big skeptic of recovered memories. But Schooler claimed to find some of these cases, I actually saw some videotapes of them, of people who seemed to recover very distinct memories of abuse. Um, and uh, in fact, some of the details did match uh, some external corroborating uh, information. But here's the catch. This is what's fascinating about these cases, is that in, in a lot of the cases he looked at, if not all, what happens is if you ask friends or relatives about the time the person claimed to have forgotten the, the memory. So the person said, I, I, had, I never thought about this. Oh my God, I remember I was abused. Uh, and I never realized. You ask friends or relatives, they will say, in the cases he identified, no, that's not true. You, you did talk about it. You did talk about it. Now, um, it's almost like the person uh, forgot that they 
remembered. And, and school, schoolers explanation, and, and a few other people have argued this too, is that what's actually happening, I don't want to say this is completely agreed on, but it's an interesting one, is that what you see in these cases, and I do think this sometimes happens, is that people actually remember the abuse, but it's not until later that they, they reconceptualize it as abusive. That they remember, they, they always have a memory of being touched, for example, by daddy, but they didn't it didn't c quite kick in. Wait a minute, that was abuse. Then they're watching Oprah, or they're reading a book, or they're in therapy, and they go, oh my God, I was abused. You know, and it's, it has the force of a new memory, but in fact, the memory is not changing. It's rather their conceptualization of the memory. But that's still a very controversial issue. I don't think it's scientifically resolved. Okay. So one that I really want to to touch on before we go to the questions is the idea that expert judgment and intuition is the best way to make clinical decisions. It's not. <laughs> um, it's just not. It's now expert judgment's not uh, useless, and there's a big controversy in the in the field about um, expertise. When do people develop expertise? When does it work? My reading of the literature, and I'm not a cognitive psychologist, but my reading of the literature is pretty consistent, that you tend to only get uh, what are called expertise effects. By expertise effect, what I mean is that people get better and better and better with something uh, with practice. Um, you tend to get expertise effects in fairly constrained situations, actually. You get expertise effects in a couple of cases where people, where the feedback is quick, where the feedback is consistent and the feedback is accurate. So in areas like computer programming or chess or things like that, there you're going to get quick feedback. It's usually going to be accurate feedback. It's going to be pretty consistent and clear feedback. In, in domains like medicine and especially psychotherapy, it's not that case at all. A lot of the feedback you get is vague. Is the person getting better or not? It's not clear. If they are getting better, is it because of what I did? If, if they're getting a little worse, is it because of what I did? Who knows? It's often delayed. You know, they may not, you may have to wait for months to see whether they're really improving or not. It's often uh, inconsistent. So in, in my own field of clinical psychology, most of the research shows that the expertise effects are not very pronounced. And what I mean by that, for example, and it's a bit ignominious, for people like me who are clinical psychologists who used to do psychotherapy, but most of the research shows, for, for example, that amount of experience as a therapist is not very related to how good a therapist you are. Um, there is a correlation. It's very, very weak. In some studies, it's, it's close to zero. Um, amount of experience in learning to use a diagnostic method, for example. Again, most studies show what are called training effects, but not experience effects. You have to be trained up on the method. You have to know enough to how to administer a particular test. But once you kind of get good at knowing how the test is given, it looks as though it kind of asymptotes very quickly after that. Um, and most of the research shows in terms of how to combine information, and this is something that we all do as clinical psychologists in practice, we get a lot of diagnostic tests, for example. You know, we get uh, self-report questionnaires, and we interview the person, we get information from relatives, we may give an IQ test, and blah, blah, blah. So we have like 10 different pieces of information in front of us. Then how do we combine that to reach a clinical decision, to make a prediction about how likely the person is to attempt suicide? These are important questions. Uh, make a diagnosis, how likely is it the person has schizophrenia as opposed to bipolar disorder, one of the classic distinctions in psychology, an important one. Um, most research shows that we would do better by using a formula that's already been derived on a sample and just plugging it into a computer uh, rather than using our clinical intuition. Most, most studies show, virtually all of them, show that computerized mechanical formulas that are derived from data actually do just as well, if not better, than clinicians. And to the extent that clinicians do okay, and some of them actually do okay, it's to the extent to which they're following that formula. And the same yeah. thing is true in, in medicine, and I think that yeah. physicians have the same reluctance to accept that reality as, as clinical psychologists do. Um, so, and, and, you know, we, we, those of us who are practicing physicians, you know, are constantly being bombarded by, you know, the studies. And, of course, one problem we have is um, figuring out, you know, is what we're being told reliable? Is it publication bias because you only they only publish the, the positive studies um, but the key idea is that um, you know being an expert doesn't mean you're, you're always right you can make all these same mistakes and that's why I think anybody you know they couldn't you know 
if, even if you were a psychologist, you might find something in here that you really, really think is true that's, that's not. So we're going to, uh, before we open up to questions, I just want to do one other thing, and that's give you a chance to tell us what your favorite pop psychology myth is. Ooh, that's a good one. My, that's a tough, my favorite pop psychology myth. Um, you know, I don't know if I, have a, if I have one favorite, but I can tell you the one, I may mean, answer a somewhat different question, and maybe you guys can explain why this is. There's one that I get asked about uh, maybe the most, and it's the one I get the most hate mail about. So maybe you guys can explain why. It's the full moon myth. Uh, I get more, you, you wouldn't think people would be that personally invested in it, right? But I get more hate mail about that saying, you're an idiot, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, of course, more weird things happen during full moon. I and mean, I love talking about it. Um, and it's, it is such a pervasive myth. Um, and. It's, a, again, a great example of where we were talking about before, of where people see connections that are not there. In this case, it's a somewhat different phenomenon. It's called illusory correlation. People are seeing a correlation, a statistical association. It's not actually there. Um, and um, again, I think one reason why people are so um, attached to that one is there's a core of truth in what they say, and I've come to realize this. So again, I, I've had arguments with people about this, and what they will typically say is, you're wrong because I've seen it over and over again. And uh, I've seen it where there's a full moon and people behave weirdly. And you know what? They're right. Uh, they're, they are seeing it. The problem is they're, they're weighting the observation incorrectly. Again, I, I often tell my students life is like a four-fold table. You know. Sounds kind of Buddhist, right? Uh, you know, uh, and and you have to look at all the cells in the table. But what ends up happening is, yes, they are seeing those cases. But what they're forgetting about, of course, are all the cases in particular. There are other cells too, but in particular, forgetting about all those cases in which there's a full moon and nothing weird happens. They're seeing those too, but they are not attending to them. So again, in a sense, that term, we use that term illusory correlation in psychology, it's a little bit of a misnomer. I think I use it too, but I'll tell you what, it is a correlation. It is, but it's up here. It's not out there. And in a certain way, our brains are actually being pretty smart. Our brains are actually computing a correlation in, in a certain way. And, and to some extent, they're right, or they would have been right, if that cell had been weighted correctly. The problem is it's our brains are attaching too much weight to that one cell. So that's the one I, I like talking about it because it's a great illustration of illusory correlation. And it's also um, one that's very subjectively compelling. Just to, if you're curious about what the research literature on that shows, there was a great meta-analysis, which is a kind of analysis of analysis that was done on this in one of our premier psychology journals called Psychological Bulletin. I can give you the reference if you want. This is a paper done like 20, 25 years ago, but it's held up again and again and again. There are like 40 different studies they looked at. They looked at pretty much everything under the moon, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, <coughs> they looked at you know, psychiatric hospital admissions, suicide attempts. And then other people looked at like dog bites and hockey fights. And, and, and anyway, they, they found I mean, it's so rare in psychology. You find absolutely nothing, but they, they found absolutely nothing when you pull all the studies together. And as I always tell my students, almost every psychology review article ends with the following kind of bland advice. Every, maybe you guys can even finish the sentence. Almost every review article in psychology ends with the following sentence. More research is, yeah, clearly more research is needed in this area. This is just about the only article in psychology I ever read that in essence ended with the following advice. In conclusion, no further research is needed in this, <laughs> in this area. Um, now, I wouldn't go quite as far uh, as that. It's always possible some, some new finding can come up. But I, I think they were sort of jokingly making the point that there's just no good evidence for that effect, even though it seems so subjectively powerful. Again, things could always change in the future. But uh, it's cert we can certainly say that, at the very least, people are perceiving a strong correlation when it's not there. I still find it hard, even though I know that when I'm Get, getting ready for work in the morning and it's still dark out and I see the full moon and I'm getting ready to go to the ER, I have to say to myself, no, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> 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 so if you want to ask a question, come on up to the mic so that everybody can hear you. Um, I have a mental illness and I've, I've uh, been through a lot of therapy <laughs> and I find it all useless. Yeah. However, medicine sorry, no. has 
changed my life and mm -hmm. made me so much better. Yeah. And I'm so grateful for modern science. Now I see that my child is going through the same thing I am, and I feel pressured for her to go through all this therapy. Yeah. And I feel like they're going to call the Child Protective Services on yeah. me if I don't do what they're saying. And um, also, they don't want to prescribe the medicine that works for me. Yeah. And I, I don't know what to do. And I, I just feel um, that there's no good evidence for what they're telling me is wrong. And that changing someone's thinking is not going to make them better. And what would you suggest I do in the face of all these experts telling me? Something? Yeah, well, first, you're very courageous. Um, and I appreciate the, the question. Um, I don't have an easy answer to that other than to give you some support. Um, and obviously, I don't know the nature, exact nature of the treatments they're prescribing. But I do think that, unfortunately, there is a real problem with a uh, lack of evidence-based practice out there. Again, I'd have to know more about the specific treatments they're prescribing and so on. But you are right that um, a lot of treatments for particular disorders are very popular or may be sort of commonly accepted that do not necessarily work. And um, uh, I do think, um, and in my own field of psychology, psychopharmacology, I think, does get a bit of a bad rap. There's no question that some medicines have been overhyped. On the other hand, there's no doubt about that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's also good evidence that for severe problems, so take depression, for example, even though we do know that some of the efficacy, some of the effectiveness of antidepressants has been overhyped. We do know that for severe depression, medicine can be helpful, and it could clearly is more effective than placebo. So all I can say is, uh, and I'd be happy to talk with you later, but to stand your ground and, and ask for evidence. I think that's the most important thing you, a consumer can do, is to turn things around. The burden of proof ultimately should be on the people who are, who are delivering the treatments, and ask them, what is the evidence? that this treatment works. Show me. Show me the studies. Uh, point to me. And, and by the way, it's uh, a little easier to do that. I'm not saying it's easy. It's a little easier to do that nowadays because there are large databases like the Cochrane database where they've meta-analyzed just about everything under the sun. Show me a Cochrane review. Show me a meta-analysis that these treatments are actually effective and put a bit of the burden of proof on them. I know that may not be a panacea. It may, may help uh, a little bit, but I, I applaud your efforts. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Hope you're okay, by the way. So I'm wondering about uh, mm -hmm. hypnosis. I know there's a lot of people from people who seem to have no credentials at all. Uh, on the other extreme, mm -hmm. I know of uh, a pr someone who teaches in a university setting who's a neuropsychologist, and mm -hmm. he claims to have used hypnosis methods to uh, especially prevent uh, blistering in burn victims. So I'm just wondering if there's yeah. a body of evidence that either debunks or yeah. supports <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, <laughs> hypnosis in, in any form. Right. So, so th that's a good question. So, what about hypnosis? Um, I'm glad you raised it. The um, I, I'm I'm a bit of a skeptic about a lot of the claims regarding hypnosis. On on the one hand, um, uh, I, I, I do think sometimes skeptics are a little too dismissive of it. Uh, however, um, there is good evidence actually from meta analyses that hypnosis can be a helpful adjunct, and I say adjunct, not a standalone treatment. Um, when combined with more traditional therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy, behavioral therapy, it may actually add a little bit to uh, treatment of depression, anxiety disorders. I would not say blisters, however. <laughs> I mean, I've heard those claims, but I'd be a little skeptical uh, of that. Um, the, the controversy, though, is, is it really specific to hypnosis, or is it merely the fact that in modern society, and this is what I lean to, but I'm willing to be persuaded otherwise, what I lean to thinking is that in modern society, a lot of people think hypnosis is a, a powerful way of inducing expectancies, and it can be effective. So I, I suspect that for, for some people in society, giving them a, a bit of hypnotic induction is a little bit more motivating, makes them think that the treatment is plausible, may, may make them more likely to try the treatment, and that's good. Um, so uh, for those purposes, hypnosis may be uh, somewhat uh, useful. I do not recommend it as a standalone treatment because there are certified hypnotherapists that use it by itself. I don't think that's justified. And in particular, and this maybe is a little uh, off from where, where your question is, so forgive me, but I do want to mention this, where I don't think hypnosis is justified is for using it for memory uh, enhancement or memory refreshment purposes. Uh, there, I think the evidence is pretty consistent that what hypnosis does is it merely 
lowers the threshold for re reporting all memories, both true and false, and it probably increases the risk of false memories. So I, I was involved in a court case in this um, where, um, make a long story short, um, the prosecution was, was using hypnosis to refresh memories of, of a crime, and someone was arrested, I think, quite unjustly. And there's just no evidence at all that hypnosis uh, can improve the accuracy of memories. It will sometimes, I think some of the popularity comes from the fact that it will sometimes yield some accurate memories. Uh, but so will getting somebody drunk. You know, occasionally <laughs> people, you know, people will start reporting all kinds of stuff. Every once in a while something will be accurate, uh, but uh, there's a lot of inaccurate stuff too, so you've got to be very skeptical. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Hello. My first question is, do you have copies of the book so I can get an autograph when I take back Oh, office? that's nice. I don't with me, no, but I'd be happy to send me one. I'll be happy to autograph it. Thank you. I'd be honored. Um, <laughs> my second question is, when you were talking about in the early 90s or the like mid-90s where there were some things in the field that you saw as practice yes. that you were like, this is not mm -hmm. act. Can you talk about that just very mm -hmm. briefly? Yes, I can. Um, there were a lot of things, but there were two in particular that come to mind that were bothering me. So in the uh, 1990s, one thing I saw in particular was the what I would now call the recovered memory craze, uh, in which uh, therapists all over the country were using highly suggestive techniques. We just got a good question about hypnosis, uh, which is not good for memory recovery, uh, whatever its other merits may be, using leading questions, using uh, asking people to diaries down or journals, uh, might they have been abused? There were self-help books recommending these kinds of things. I was pretty appalled, actually. Uh, I was appalled by two things. I was appalled by the fact that um, a lot of therapists, and we know from two different surveys at the time, about 25% of therapists were regularly using these techniques to recover memories um, of, of early abuse, even though they may not have existed. And I was equally appalled, I have to say, and I may sometimes make some enemies saying this, but I was equally appalled by the silence of much of the academic community in responses. There were some courageous people who I'm proud to call friends like uh, Elizabeth Loftus, uh, Stephen J. Lynn, uh, Steve Cease and others who railed against this, but a lot of people just stayed quiet. Um, the other one that was very big at that time that many skeptics will be familiar with is, is facilitated communication for autism. That was also getting very big at that time. Um, the claim, as, as many of you may know, is that uh, autistic individuals uh, can uh, supposedly who were previously uh, uncommunicative, even totally mute, could communicate on a letter pad keyboard uh, with the aid of a facilitator. That was very popular at the time, um, even though there was, I think, pretty overwhelming evidence that it was due to inadvertent control of the individual's uh, hand and finger movements by the facilitator. Um, incidentally, one thing we have to remember as skeptics is that people uh, have a very short memory uh, the population has a very short memory. Unless we're eternally vigilant, these things will, will come back. Facilitated communication is an example. It's making a big comeback. Uh, it's be, being used all over the place again now. I don't think it's quite as popular as it once was, but it is being used um, a lot. And um, uh, CNN has uh, broadcast some, some documentaries, including Autism as a World, that were very uncritical about facilitated communication. So we have to be very, very careful. So those were two among many, but those two in particular bothered me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I guess Hi. that's one of the benefits of getting older. At least you can remember this previous stuff. And it's like, well, wait, wasn't that just popular yesterday? <laughs> but uh, you know, I want to make one comment, and then I have a question. Um, when you mentioned earlier the uh, idea that anger is something that builds up that you have to release, I've just finished reading an anger management book for personal <laughs> reasons, and that is actually one of the myths that he lists in that book, and he attributes that to Freud, that yes, it is not well, good something, for him. Yeah, that, <laughs> that yes, it's not something that builds up. The reason you get that build-up effect is because you're reliving the trigger over and over, and you keep re-triggering yourself. That book talked about um, anger hooks, responses, needs, things like that. I found it very helpful. Yeah, sometimes self-help is good. So there's a great yeah, example. No, that, yeah, that, that, yeah that, that's yeah. actually, well, the author seems to have decent credentials. And I think if I could just interject one point there, I think people forget that we humans are a smart, smart species so we can think about what we're thinking. And I think one reason that uh, 
anger often feeds on itself is, and I think many of us will realize this, when we get angry, it's not very pleasant, and then we get angry about the fact that we're angry, because it's not a lot of fun, and then we get angry about the fact that we're angry about the anger, and it just kind of feeds on itself, and, and it doesn't help very yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, and it, anyway, so I'm trying to learn to be less reactive in certain things, because in this day and age, you, you, you can't express anger, it's not appropriate. Um, but what I actually wanted to ask, and I think this is something that's rooted in some kind of popular psychology idea, is the idea of employers having you evaluate yourself. Yeah. I have mean, grown. I've had to do it. My husband has had to do it. Yeah. We both think that this is five shades of wrong because if you're one of these people who thinks you're awesome, you're going to give yourself a really good evaluation. Yeah. And if you're somebody who's deeply critical of yourself, you're going to pick yourself to pieces. And how obviously they, 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 they have some reason for wanting to do this, but I, I, Feels I good. don't That's why. <laughs> I don't see it as any kind of useful tool, and I just want yeah, to hear some so, commentary so you, on I, that. I can't say a bit about that. Actually, I had this once. Uh, I had to do my clinical internship uh, as part of my training in um, a place called Western Psychiatric Association, uh, Western Psychiatric uh, Institute in Pittsburgh. And uh, I had that on one of my uh, rotations. I had to evaluate myself and give myself a, a grade from A to F on different aspects of my functioning. And amazing, I gave myself an A on everything. I don't, I don't know what it was. I did. Um, it was a, what a shot. Um, yeah, I, I don't know why it's so popular. I suspect one reason is that it uh, excuses uh, employers from the difficult task of having to make hard evaluations, which I can tell you is not fun, having had to do it myself. Um, it's probably not a good idea. One thing we know, um, there's a researcher at Cornell, David Dunning and Justin Kruger at, at Brown, who have done a lot of work. I can send you the references if you want, but there is a wonderful, if you want to look it up, there is a wonderful review of this in a journal called um, Psychological Science in the Public Interest a couple of years back. Very comprehensive. It's been a big area of research in psychology actually over the last decade or so. There's been a lot of work on self-evaluation. How good are we at evaluating ourselves? And we're not, we're not so good. <laughs> we're, not, we're not too good. And, and you have it exactly right. Um, what ends up showing is this, is they kind of, it's not a very politically correct term, but they often call it the, the double curse of incompetence, that people who are not very good at, and let's face it, we're all incompetent in some domains, um, people who are not very good in a particular domain are often the very people to think they're the best at it. And if you look, and I've seen this anecdotally in my own psychology classes, and then there's actually research showing this, that the very people who think, for example, as they're walking out of the exam, that they aced it, are the very people who did the most poorly. Uh, and and you, I think you're, conversely, you're exactly right, that oftentimes people who are doing the best on the exams often think they, they bomb. And I think the secret here is what psychologists call metacognition, thinking about thinking. If you're someone who is very thoughtful, if you're always introspecting on how you're doing, you're always racking your brain against the wind, I'm not sure I know this very well, uh, you're often going to do better, but you're actually going to have more doubts about how well you did. So um, we're not particularly good at self-evaluation. It's not useless if you ask people I should estimate their IQ scores, for example. Uh, it's not totally uncorrelated with their actual IQ. The correlation is about a 0.2, 0 0.3 or so with a maximum correlation of, point of uh, 1.0. It's not, it's not zero, but it's pretty low. So I, I, you can use it as one adjunctive guy, but I would not rely on it. Um, I'm just curious about your opinion. This may be new to me, but a lot of the books that are currently out with neuropsychology mm -hmm. and changing your brain and looking at specific activities that mm -hmm. may help to bring together a particular balance, especially in the elementary yeah. Um, situation. Yeah, there is. Um, I would not say I'm an expert in that. I appreciate the question. Um, I, I do know enough to know that there is a lot of hype and a lot of pseudoscience in the educational field a lot, and um, I would be really skeptical of it. I think the problem is that we in psychology, with apologies to Sigmund Freud, tend to have a little bit of a case of um, neuroscience envy, um, and um, it makes us seem more scientific to talk about things at the neural level of analysis somehow, and um, there are all these techniques like brain gym, and, and my, my late dear friend Barry Beierstein, um, passed away a couple of years ago, was a real expert in this, brain tuners, and these things are, are so big in the educational community, and a lot of them really are massively, uh, massively overhyped, so I'd, I'd be a little bit, um, uh, a little bit careful. Another big one, 
um, sometimes it's talked about at the neuro level, sometimes not, is this whole idea of matching students' uh, learning styles to particular teaching styles, that more visual learners do better with visual teachers, and more kinesthetic learners do better with kinesthetic teachers, and some people have brought in neuroscience to explain that. The evidence actually does not support that claim very well. There are, not surprisingly, certain teaching styles that just work better across the board. Teachers who have high standards, high expectations, give students good skills to meet those expectations, do better. But this whole matching hypothesis, a lot of which is derived from neuroscience notions, is just not supported very well. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> Can I wear that later? Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I think you'll be swimming in it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it. <laughs> but uh, I work, okay, I would wonder your opinion on something. I work in a behavioral health ward. I work in inpatient um, behavioral health. And I, I like our psychologists and, nurse, and um, psychologists and psych psychiatrists. It's just our nurses are so full of this, like, the pseudoscience and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And these are the people with the direct contact, most of the direct contact with yeah. the patients. And it's just really frustrating for me working there mm -hmm. because, you know, you all have nurses come up to me like, because I have um, uh, some medical problems, and they'll, they'll be like, oh, you know, let's just, the, the, all you'll need is just do this holistic this stuff, and uh, here's, my, here's the card for my holistic doctor. And I'm like, you know what, I have a urologist and a nephrologist yeah. that says you're wrong, so I'm done now. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and it's just, I am so appalled by how much pseudoscience is there, and these are the people that actually sit and talk with the, the, the patients yeah. far more than the, um, psychologists and psychiatrists, I mean, we have an acupuncturist on the ward. We have an, I mean, he's also a nurse, but yeah. he's, we have an acupuncturist on the ward who actually one time went, you know, it was like, I passed about 12 kidney stones in the last year. He's like, oh, I can do this. I, be, I can help you out with that. It's just, I know some acupuncture for kidney stones. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. I don't care what you well, say. Yeah. <laughs> yes, let me, no, let me try to answer your question. Um, I've seen this too. It's it's not unique to nurses. I have worked with um, back when I did clinical work. I worked with a lot of psychiatric nurses. Some of whom were, were great. Some of them were, were not so good. Um, not unique to nurses. It may be somewhat more prevalent. Uh, wouldn't surprise me because I think the quality of training in that field is not so good. I'll give you one uh, example. At, at Embry University, when I first got here in the mid 1990s, they were teaching courses in um, therapeutic touch uh, to the Emory uh, nurses. They were actually teaching formal courses in this stuff. Here's what I think. Uh, my take on this, and it's not unique to nurses, it may be somewhat more common among them, I, I see it among social workers, I also see it among psychologists, even the PhD level. I think what often draws people to those kinds of professions, and it, frankly what drew me in part too, is something healthy, which is nurturance. I think what you tend to see among people who are drawn to those professions is they are very caring, very nurturant, and that's good, you need to have that. The mistake I think that's often made in training is what people don't realize is that to be an effective provider, mental health and, and medical provider, nurturance is, is essential, but it's not enough. Uh, and, and it has to be combined with a scientific approach. And I think what we know, and, and this is where it gets a little tough, if we look at the literature, and this is um, something psychologists I think have discovered over the past decade or 15 years or so, I don't think it's widely appreciated among us skeptics is that those very traits being empathic, being nurturant, liking people. If you look at the literature, uh, they tend to be actually somewhat negatively correlated with uh, knowledge and, and interests and aptitude in science and math. Uh, so people who, who say, I, and I get undergraduates like this, I just want to help people. Um, I just, and I, I'm not, th those are often people who are not very good at science. So what we need to do as a field, I think, is twofold. First, we need to find people who are in that cell, and there are plenty of them who are very nurturant, who are very empathic, but also are interested in acquiring scientific training. And very importantly, we, for those people who, maybe for science doesn't come as naturally, help them to understand that science is our very best safeguard against those kinds of errors that I, science is ultimately the most humane approach and if you are truly empathic if you are truly nurturant science is it may seem uh, because of the way we often teach it it may seem kind of cold inhuman cold calculating but in fact it's ultimately a prescription for humility and it's a prescription for for the best helping so on the very poppy side of pop psychology is the psychological plot device on television. <laughs>
The, the what? I'm sorry. The psychological plot device. Oh, plot devices. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The temporary amnesia that was <laughs> rampant in soap operas in the 80s. Yeah. So and Stockholm syndrome takes about ten minutes Ugh. to develop. Yeah. So do you, do you have like a favorite when you you watch a television show and then you say, does anybody buy this? this yeah. Well, first thing you have to realize is that I'm a professor, which means I have no life. Uh, so <laughs> I, I don't watch TV nearly as much as I once did. But but you, you're right. I mean, there are and I do. Uh, I used to be a bit of a movie buff. I don't go much anymore. But uh, that's one of the things that would make me pull my hair out is I, w I would always be amazed, and maybe you guys will see this too, and, it's, and I have a friend, Sid Perkowitz, actually at Emory, who's, who has written about science in the movies. But I'm always amazed when you go to these movies and you see they spend like 30, 40 million dollars on all these special effects and things blowing, and it's unbelievable. My God. And then they, they didn't bother to pay someone like Sid or me, you know, or someone uh, better than me. Uh, we could probably, we'd probably do it for, uh, for free. You know, or, or maybe a, a two hundred dollars or something. You know, they would have solved all these problems and, uh, and been more accurate. So, so the the amnesia is a great one. That we actually do talk about that in, in our book. That that's a really common one. This myth that people uh, frequently forget. Uh, you know, they wake up, for example, and they forget. Forget. It's so comical. You know, all details of their previous. Uh, life, who they were, where they're born. Otherwise, they're completely normal, you know. And, um, right, they still speak uh, a language. And they still, right, they, exactly. Yeah, they can drive yeah. a car, but they don't know their own first name. Right. Well, that's a hopeful myth, I think. Unfortunately, there's a case. Um, sometimes debunking myths comes with a hopeful message. That won't, that's one I have to say comes with a somewhat less hopeful message. When people have been unconscious for a long time, for many years, but it's very important for people to know this, they're not very likely to wake up without some pretty significant deficits. Um, the other big problem, and this is also the other mistake, is amnesia for the past uh, is a, a so-called uh, anterograde amnesia, where you forget what happened, is a lot less of a problem, um, or so-called retrograde amnesia, uh, where you're forgetting what happened in the past, is a lot less of a problem than anterograde amnesia, uh, the ability to remember new things. That is far and away a much more common uh, and serious uh, problem. The film Memento actually is uh, one case where the uh, the movie industry got it mostly right. It's not a perfect movie, but it's actually pretty good. I actually uh, talked to a friend of mine, Stefan Hammond, who's a memory expert at Emory. He actually gave that film, I think, about an A minus. He said it was pretty, pretty good. Uh, the one thing he said was not accurate is in the film. I'm forgetting the character's name, but he put like signs on himself. Mm -hmm. I think and he said that sometimes people that interrogate and usually will try that, but it doesn't work because they forget to look at the <laughs> at the sign, so <laughs> it doesn't work. But but by and large, that was a rare case where it was fairly accurate. So maybe time for a couple more questions. Yeah. Oh, just one? Oh, okay, that's too bad. Oh. Um, what do you think of the criticisms of IQ tests and the theory of multiple intelligences? So what do I think of the criticisms of IQ tests and multiple intelligences? Um, yeah. Depends on the nature of the criticisms. I think that IQ tests have gotten a uh, bit of a bad rap, I think, including uh, by some people in the skeptical community. Um, I do think that they are surprisingly predictive of important real-world outcomes. They do predict occupational performance pretty much across the board, uh, and, and the more complex and difficult the occupation is, the better uh, they are as, uh, as predictors. They, uh, they predict a lot of real-world behaviors. They predict educational performance. They predict uh, ability to learn new tasks and so on. So they, they're not useless. Um, um, one criticism, however, I think that has some force is uh, Keith Stanovich is at University of Ontario. He's written a pretty good book um, called What IQ Tests Miss. I think it came out in 2009. I'd recommend it highly to you. And it, this, uh, I was pleasantly surprised to read this book. I have a lot of respect for Stanovich. Uh, it was not the typical diatribe uh, against IQ testing. But he argues, I think pretty persuasively actually, that IQ tests are pretty useful for predicting kind of the strength of our mental engines, kind of the ability to learn new things. But, and this is relevant to the skeptical community, he argues that they're not very good predictors of critical thinking. Um, and uh, if you look at correlations between uh, overall IQ and lots of life outcomes, they're pretty high. For critical thinking, they're pretty low. And that, I think, helps us to explain why a lot of us are puzzled in the skeptical community. We see, like, Nobel Prize winning people, like, endorsing you know, uh, techniques that don't work, you know. Um, and a lot of people who um, 
endorse things that are paranormal actually seem pretty smart. And, and it may not be because they're dumb, they may just not have learned scientific thinking skills. And, and again, it comes, maybe to come back full circle, it comes back to the point that scientific thinking um, does not come naturally. Multiple intelligences, it kind of reminds me, final point, kind of reminds me of the learning styles myth. I think it's a politically correct notion. There's no question that we all have certain strengths and weaknesses intellectually. That's true. Whether or not, though, these are truly multiple intelligences, I think, is not entirely clear. What you typically find is a lot of those strengths and weaknesses, uh, it's true we have them, but in fact, a lot of these specific abilities, like linguistic ability, mathematical ability, spatial ability, uh, musical ability, artistic, they actually are somewhat correlated with each other. They're not as independent as some people like Howard Gardner or others think. So I would prefer, rather than call them multiple intelligence, just to point out that there is probably one general factor of intelligence. Some people probably have somewhat stronger uh, mental engines than others, but within that we also have specific patterns of strengths and weaknesses. I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Campbell and Dr. Lillenfeld for, for coming out. Brian Dunning will be doing a reading in here very shortly, which is going to be fairly entertaining because Brian is fairly entertaining. <laughs> um, and if you guys want to you we'll know, stick around, but stick um, around and thanks great. for the great questions. It was a terrific audience. Really was yeah. awesome. Thank yeah. you all. Thank you.